Hey everybody, it is Michael and this is part two of the aftercare video on shame. It's the day before Thanksgiving on Wednesday the 27th and here's the overview for this video. Um, I'm going to follow up on shame and talk about the beginnings of breaking shame. Um, but before I do that, I want to read something. Recently I was given a book uh, it is this book. It's really cool, leather looking, and it's called Every Moment Holy. And it's by uh, Douglas McKelvey. Some of you may have heard of Andrew Peterson, who is a musician in Nashville. He's good friends with Andy Gullihorn and Andy's wife, Jill Phillips. Every uh, December, they tour all throughout the country, Andrew Peterson and the Gullihorns and several others. And that's how I learned about Doug McKelvey in this book. Um, it's available through Rabbit Room uh, Press or rabbitroom.com, where there's all kinds of uh, indie music and publications like this book. It's a very interesting book because it's all about liturgies. And let me just take a moment because I, I love this book so much and it might be helpful for you. Uh, there are liturgies which are simply readings around scripture that have a kind of call and response so that there's a reader and then a response and uh, if you're not part of a church that does liturgy uh, you don't have to actually have a reader and a response you can read it yourself and it becomes like a prayer but there's liturgies of labor and vocation for example a liturgy for doing laundry or preparation of a meal liturgies for first responders and waiters and waitresses, a liturgy for home repairs, uh, for the first snow, for gardening, uh, for consuming media, liturgies for feasting with friends, moving into a new home. And my very favorite <clears throat> is called Liturgy for Battling a Destructive Desire. You may have said, okay, Cusick, where are you going with this? But I want to read this at the start, because if all I did was read this, uh, hopefully it would be worth watching. So, it's a liturgy for a person battling a destructive desire. Jesus, here I am again, desiring a thing that were I to indulge in it would war against my own heart in the hearts of those I love. O Christ, rather let my life be thine. Take my desires, let them be subsumed in still greater desire for you, until there remains no room for these lesser cravings. In this moment, I might choose to indulge a fleeting hunger, or I might choose to love you more. Faced with this temptation, I would rather choose you, Jesus, but I am weak, so be my strength. I am shadowed, be my light. I am selfish, unmake me now and refashion my desires according to the better designs of your love. Given the choice of shame or glory, let me choose glory. Given the choice of this moment or eternity, let me choose in this moment what is eternal. Given the choice of this easy pleasure or the harder road of the cross, give me grace to choose to follow you. Knowing that there is nowhere apart from your presence where I might find the peace I long for, no lasting satisfaction apart from your reclamation of my heart. Let me build, then, my King, a beautiful thing by long obedience, by the steady progression of small choices that laid end to end will soon become like the stones of a pleasing path, stretching to eternity unto your welcoming arms and unto the sound of your voice pronouncing the judgment, Well done. That is built around... James chapter 1 verses 14 and 15 and that battling of a destructive desire is something that I want you to simply listen to again you can back up the video but I have gone ahead and photographed 
the words, and I'm including two screenshots of those in the email that you will have received to watch this video. I especially love that last part where it talks about shame or glory, and then ultimately how God says, well done, well done. And the whole point of this video is less to get into clinical or specific teachings about shame and more to get into God's heart for us when we feel shame. And specifically, those words about choosing glory or shame. That's really important to hear because we might think that if we make the right decision, if somehow we are able to muscle our way into obedience, that then we will have chosen glory, and that if we somehow fell, that we are choosing shame. And I just want to say to you that shame is a lie. Shame is always a lie. And as you're going to hear, the shame comes from the enslavement and the trap of performance, and that I have to obey, and that I have to be free, and I have to not make a mistake in order to hear the well done. The well done comes from trusting God and the righteousness that he has given to us, that he has given to you. And remember, the righteousness means not the absence of sin, but right relatedness. And right relatedness is that God loves you. God has embraced you. God's kindness and mercy are there for you. And that righteousness does not come from performing or being sinless. There's something about this truth that, as I've said before, will actually free you to be less compulsive about your sin. So let's jump in. I've written a page of notes, and I'm going to read from those on the side. First thing I want to do is read a verse from Psalm 25, verses 2 and 3. I've been reading the Psalms lately, and it's amazing how much the Psalms talk about shame. And just so you don't get confused, there's times where the psalmist says, God, don't let me be put to shame. And then there's other times where he says, put shame upon my enemies. This is God's word, but it's God's word of David in his brokenness um, explaining his best human understanding. God doesn't put shame upon enemies. Uh, God allows those enemies to experience the natural consequences of their behavior. And ultimately, if a behavior is violent or destructive or attacking, whether that's King David or someone else, that that shame is a natural consequence of not doing something wrong but of not trusting, aligning themselves with God and trusting in his goodness imparted to them and trusting in his pronouncement of goodness over them. So, Psalm 25, verses 2 and 3. And remember, this is King David. God, I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. Now, let me read that same verse about, I trust in you, don't let me be put to shame, and no one who trusts in you will ever be put to shame. I want to read that same passage from the message. Well, I won't read it because I don't have it in front of me. But where, where um, David in the New International talks about shame, here's what Here's what uh, Eugene Peterson has translated in the message. God, I have my head held high. So there's a picture in the Psalms where shame is about our head down, focused on self, not exposing myself to the light, and being without shame is a head that's lift up or lifted up. We'll see a verse about this in a minute. Shame is, in the message in Psalm 25, listen to this phrase. He says, there's no hangdog skulking going on. 
you won't embarrass me, will you, God? So there's this sense of my head is not hangdog and skulking. And God, you're not the kind of God that embarrasses me, but you're a God that allows me to hold my head high. But here's often what our experience is. In Psalm 44, verse 15, listen to these words. And these are the words that we will struggle with when we have um, fallen, when we have moved away from God, when we have found ourselves unloving. It may or may not be when we indulge in sexual sin or lust or pornography, but this is the experience when we trust in our own performance. Psalm 44, 15, I live in disgrace all day long and my face is covered in shame. Wow, can I relate to that. I live in disgrace all day long and my face is covered in shame. What is disgrace? Disgrace is disgrace. Disgrace is not grace. Disgrace is I have to perform in order to be worthy, in order to be loved, in order to be adequate, in order to um, have people see me and say, thumbs up, you've got what it takes. God invites us to step out of shame saying, live in grace, not disgrace. And now listen to these words where the psalmist experience what he feels and what he thinks and what he believes is my face is covered in shame. But now listen to Psalm 34, verse 5. Those who look to you, O God, are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. <laughs> so Psalm 44, the example of I'm in disgrace and my face is covered with shame. And then God says in his, in his inspired word through David in another psalm, which means another moment, another day where he's writing in his journal, if you will, and he's connecting with the truth. God, those who look to you are radiant and their faces are never covered with shame. There's no red blushing. There's no embarrassment. There's no racing in your heart. There's no burning in your gut. Now, who are the ones who look to him? The ones who look to him are not people that somehow get it together every day and have a quiet time. The ones who look to him are those who belong to Jesus. The ones who have looked to the cross once, twice, or forever and said, God, you made him who had no sin to become sin for me so that in him I become righteous. Here's Michael's paraphrase. In other words, God, because of what Jesus did on the cross, I no longer have to perform. I no longer have to live life on a basis where I'm ashamed or I'm not ashamed, where my face is covered with shame or during a really good day or week or month or season, somehow I have your radiance in my life and my face is uncovered with shame. No, this is a once for all deal. Those who look to you, God, are radiant and their faces are never covered with shame. Listen to Psalm 31, one. Here again is this cry and this prayer between, I am living in disgrace and my face is covered with shame, and then this radiance. Psalm 31, and you, Lord, have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Verse 20 of Psalm 25, I read verses 2 and 3 earlier. Guard my life and rescue me, God. Do not let me be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness. Do you hear that? That the delivering from shame is not the absence of sin. The deliverance comes from trusting in righteousness. Now, if you don't believe that, read Psalm 119, verses 1 through 12, roughly. It's David, the psalmist, he says, Oh, that my ways were blameless. I wish that I obeyed your decrees. I am not steadfast in obeying your decrees, O Lord. It actually starts out saying, blessed are they whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and obey him in all of his ways. But then his very next sentence is, 
Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. But I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. Again, do you hear the language? Downcast and head held low versus I will praise you with an upright heart. I wish that I obeyed them. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. But I can hold my head high. Why? Because of the righteousness that has been given to me. Finally, listen to this last verse, and this is in Psalm 3. I mentioned this on the weekend, and this is the ones I regularly come back to. Psalm 3, But you, O Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, the one who lifts my head. Do you hear it? God, you're the shield. You're the protector around me. And you're my glory. Any radiance and any glory comes from deep within where you are. Any radiance or glory comes from upon who you say I am, how you have made me in your image, how you have pronounced me clean and righteous. And so the glory comes from you, and therefore my shame is not dependent on my performance, but you, O Lord, lift my head. Psalm 3, I think verse 5. Brothers, where are you with shame? You've heard me say in the last video and again here that shame more than sexual temptation is what keeps the cycle of addiction going around and around. Shame is like a raincoat over the soul that repels the living water of Jesus that would establish us as his beloved. And so do we do what do we do with shame? I encourage you to identify the lies. One of the four core beliefs that I talked about in the previous video, number one, I'm basically a bad or unworthy person. I'm not good enough. I don't measure up. Number two, nobody would love me for who I really am, so I have to create a false self. Number three, I can't get my needs met by depending on others. My wife won't have sex with me. My wife isn't available for me. She's too busy. I'm single, I'm never going to get married, I can't have the desires of my heart filled, so I have to meet those needs myself. And then lastly, blank is my most important need, attention, affection, affirmation, acceptance, significance, security, satisfaction. If I've got to get affirmation, acceptance, and significance, and I can't rely on others to do it, then I have to perform. Do you see how shame keeps that cycle going? And how, because I have to perform to do that, I will never be able to do it enough, which reinforces every one of those core beliefs and every one of those lies. So brothers, back to Psalm 34, and I want to end with this. And I encourage you to meditate on this. Those who look to you, O oh God, are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. So I want to end with two things. Number one, I encourage you to go to that verse in Psalm 37 and read it out loud and close your eyes and ask God to give you a picture of how he sees you with radiance on your face and your face is not covered with shame, but with glory because he is your shield and he is the one who lifts your head. Open the eyes of these brothers' hearts, Lord, and open the eyes of my heart that we would see how you see, that we would see ourselves as you see us, and lift our heads from shame. Help us to hold our heads up high instead of the hangdog skulking and the other phrase of living in a sense of embarrassment or less than. The second thing I want to invite you to do is to identify the lies, to write them down like you did on the weekend. You don't have to do it on a rock. And to say, God, this is the voice in this hand of deception and accusation. And in this hand is the voice of truth. It's the voice of love. And then I will renounce this lie I 
break agreement with this lie in the name of Jesus Christ. And I ask you to pronounce your truth over me. In Surfing for God, the Invisible Battle, I simply give the three-step process of announce the lie, renounce the lie, and God pronounce the truth over me. That is Spiritual Warfare 098. Jesus has given you his power and authority. And in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 6, it says that you have a divine power to demolish a stronghold, which are the beliefs and lies that stand in the way of knowing God. Your father, the God that looks like Jesus, has said, I am the one that lifts your head. I have put a radiance on you. I have given you my righteousness. And so that prayer, don't let my face be covered in shame. Don't let me live in disgrace. God says, I'm not letting you. You're righteous. Believe the truth. I hope that each and every one of you are able to get some encouragement out of these videos. Tomorrow is Thanksgiving. I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for the story of grace in my life. And I know that that same process, no matter where you're at, no matter what you're feeling, is happening in you. For he who began a good work in you is carrying that work on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. With affection and love, this is Michael, and I bless you.